Good morning, Mavuno. How are you doing? It's really great to see you, and I'm so excited that we're talking about Fearless. Uh, it happens, like we say, in just less than three weeks' time. So please make the time to come. I also want to just say some of you actually have businesses that you think should be marketing to an audience as big as this. We're going to have people from all over the world and all over the city as well, and the country and the continent. Last year, we had about 20 countries represented, I believe, uh, at Fearless. And so if you have a company that you think uh, has products that you would want to uh, highlight to the groups that are coming, uh, please, uh, you can also sign up at the food court at the, at the Fearless desk and let us know whether you'd like to be, uh, you can actually book one of the stalls. Thank you for every one of you who's actually uh, becoming, bringing their companies on board to sponsor Fearless as well. Uh, that's very exciting for me to see Mavunites uh, going into their companies. Some of you are business owners, and you're saying we want to have a part in sponsoring this. Some of you actually are, are managers who have responsibility over budgets, and you're saying we want our, our, our company associated with an, uh, an event like this. So thank you. And by the way, that's why you can afford it at such a cheap price. Uh, you know that 1800 is not enough. Uh, to come get materials, get lunch for three days and learn like that. And it's because of the sponsorship that the different companies are giving. And so thank you very much for every one of you uh, who's going out of your way to do this. Please sign up. Um, like we said, if you need to take the time off, bring your work team uh, from the office. Uh, this is going to be a phenomenal, phenomenal time. And then let me also say just my own personal happy Father's Day to all the men of Mavuno Church. So proud of the men of this church. Uh, this is an awesome church, uh, and I thank God for the men who come to this church. And you know, many of the men uh, have a testimony similar to that guy. They came here because they had there the was uh, the were other things to see. But they came and the Lord transformed them and now they are leaders of men not running after women, isn't it? And so this is what God is doing to the men in this church. I'm going to ask the men in this church to stand up right now. All the men in Mavuno, stand up to your feet. We want to speak a blessing over you and to appreciate you. Come on, ladies, let's appreciate the men of Mavuno Church. To God be the glory for every single man here. Let me invite my wife if she would just come, Pastor Carol. And I want you to say a blessing. We believe a lot in the Father's blessing here at Mavuno Church. But today we want to receive a Mother's blessing over the men of Mavuno Church. So men, if you just receive this blessing. Men of Mavuno! <laughs> Let me just say that as the women here, we are so happy and so proud of you guys. I do not know if everyone knows this, but we have our men coming every Wednesday early in the morning to pray. And that is fantastic. And I know that the calling of a man of men is to be a prophet, to be a priest, to be a protector, and to be a provider. And that is my prayer for you guys today. That the Lord will take you to the next level in, the, in, in these roles that he has given you. So let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that, uh, for, for the role that you have given men of leadership. I thank you, Father, that um, you have given them that anointing. And Lord, this morning, I want to pray that you would release your anointing even in a greater way so that our men would be the leading priests, our men would be the leading prophets, our men would be the leading providers, our men would be the leading protectors. Father, we thank you and we ask that you'd release your blessing and release your anointing upon these men who we are truly proud of. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's hear it one more time for the men of Mavuno Church. To God be the glory for you. Let me also say that this coming Saturday, uh, Transform Kenya, which is run by Pastor Simon, one of our very, uh, our very own Pastor Simon, he runs Transform Kenya. And they have a, a program uh, which uh, is called Man Enough. And many of you know it because you've been through their program for the men. We have a father and son's day on Saturday. And so if you have a son who's somewhere between 6 to 18 years of age, you're qualified for this day, please bring them. You can actually sign up for the father and son's expedition. We're actually going to, to Mount Longanot. Actually, is it? No, no. Hell's Gate. Uh, we're going to storm the gates of hell uh, with our sons and teach them how to be men as we do that. And so come, uh, please register. It's going to be Saturday. I think we leave from here. Uh, we, we meet here at 7 o'clock in the morning. And then we spend the day, we should be back here by four. So if you would like to sign yourself up and your son or sons, or maybe you are a, a father, a, 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 an uncle, and you would like to bring your nephew for this as well, uh, please sign them up and would love to have you uh, come and participate with that. Now, I want to ask a question as usual when I start. I think I'm pretty predictable, aren't I? Uh, everybody knows what I'm going to do when I start. But here's my question. Um, what do you consider the most important quality of a good friend? You know, like if you, if you have a friend who's like your real friend, somebody who's a good friend, they have this quality. Somebody who does not have this quality does not qualify to be a good friend in your book, isn't it? 
We're all different. Uh, some of us, it's uh, different things that we like in a good friend. But every one of us has something where you're like, when I think of the people who've been my really close friends or the ones I wish had been, uh, this is a quality that they'd have. Come on, turn to your neighbor and share one quality that you consider an essential quality of a good friend. Just explain it a little bit. Don't just give them a word, but tell them what that means. And if you don't know them, introduce yourself to them. You'd be surprised you might meet somebody here who would be a, a great business contact, great future spouse, etc., etc. <laughs> Vital quality of a good friend. And after you've shared, let them share theirs with you. Wow. I think it's a question that almost every one of us has an opinion on. Uh, probably as many opinions as there are people here. Now, I asked this question, and I got a few answers, so I want to see if you identify with some of these answers. Uh, some of you, for, for you, the most important quality is loyalty. Somebody who has my back and defends me even when other people talk badly about me. Let me just see loyalty. Big deal for me. Wow, I mean, okay, all of you. <laughs> all right, that's interesting. That's quite a big one here then. Okay, dependability. Somebody who's not just with me for the good times, but in the bad times as well. Not just in my limo, but when I have to jab as well. Uh, anybody, anybody, okay, okay, I can see there's quite a lot of people. That's a huge one as well. Okay, acceptance. Somebody who sticks with me even despite my messes and my issues. I got issues and I want somebody who knows me and sticks with me. Okay, the rest of you don't have issues. Praise God for you. Uh, Somebody, say, somebody else said uh, availability. This person, you know, they're those friends where you're the, always the one who calls them, you're the one who initiates, you're the one who pokes them on Facebook. They never, you know, and now you're thinking, I need friends who also poke me back, you know? It's like they look for me as well. Anybody who wants friends who are like uh, really available, all right, I can see that's a big one as well. Okay, some people probably said something to do with a sense of humor. Somebody who's fun. I mean, life is hard. You want guys who make you laugh? All right. I can see quite a few of you. Now, here's the thing. We must all agree, and I'm sure many of us agree, that good friends like this are not easy to find. They're not. They're not. And, and, and you, some of you might be wondering, why are we talking about friends today? And I'm going to explain that in a minute. Let me just bring our visitors up to speed first of where we are. We're going through a series called Unafraid. And we're learning about five qualities of true courage from the life of one of the most courageous men, in the Bible. His name is David. We began by saying that the foundation for true courage is alignment. That you know, when you understand, when you're facing an impossible situation, and yet you know that God wants you to face it and overcome it, it doesn't matter how impossible it is. You will have the, the courage to overcome it because you know what God wants in that situation. And we say that the first thing you want to do if you want to have real courage is be aligned. Understand what God is saying. Be able to obey Him in the moment. And this will be a basis for serious courage in your life. Last week we said that true courage is built by endurance. And we said that many of us in the journey of faith, we're going to come across wildernesses, difficult dry seasons. And rather than run away from them or avoid them or deny them, that one of the ways we can truly build our courage is understand that endurance is actually a sign of courage. That it's not always good for us to run away from the pain, but sometimes what we need to do is lean into it. And understand what God is doing through it. And sometimes God is able to turn that pain into a platform that can impact the lives of many. And this week I've had great conversations with different ones of you. I know that I've heard uh, reports that life groups had some really great conversations around this. Uh, people talking about the kind of wilderness they're going through. And God is giving meaning to that. There are some of you who are so discouraged last week. But this week there's been a new light in your eye as you begin to understand that this, this, this is a way for me to build the courage as I endure this with God's help. Now today we want to go into the third quality of true courage. And I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Samuel, chapter 23. 2 Samuel, chapter 23, uh, a great story there. 2 Samuel 23, verse 8 to 12. I love the stories in the Bible, and I especially love the stories about King David. He was such an amazing guy. Almost every story about him is, 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 is worth reading and just enjoyable uh, to read. So 2 Samuel, chapter 23. And I'm going to read a, a short uh, from, from verse 8. Actually, I'll read all the way to verse 17. 
If you're there, say I'm there. All right. If you're not, say I'm still looking. <laughs> All right. Okay, Second Samuel 23, and I'm going to start from verse 8. This is what it says, and you can follow on the screen if you don't have your Bible with you. These are the names of David's mighty warriors. Josheb Bashebeth, a Takimonite, was chief of the three. He raised his spear against 800 men, whom he killed in one encounter. Next to him was Eliezer, son of Dodai, the Ahohite. And as one of the three mighty warriors, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered at Pastamim for battle. Then the Israelites retreated, but Eliezer stood his ground and stuck, uh, struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. The Lord brought a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eliezer, but only to strip the dead. Next to him was Shammah, son of Agi, the Hararite. When the Philistines banded together at a place where there was a field full of lentils, Israel's troops fled from them. But Shammah took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck the Philistines down, and the Lord brought about a great victory. During harvest time, three of the 30 chief warriors came down to David at the cave of Adullam, while the band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. At that time, David was in the stronghold, and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water and said, Oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. So the three mighty warriors broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord. Far be it from me, Lord, to do this, he said. Is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives? And David would not drink it. Such were the exploits of the three mighty warriors. Father, I pray that as we come to your word this morning, you who is the, the light of our souls, you who is the one who guides our lives, that Lord, you would take this word that is a written word and turn it through your Holy Spirit into the living word that transforms us into who you want us to be. Father, we come hungry for you and we pray that you would feed us. We recognize that the enemy of our soul would not want us to apprehend this word. Indeed, would we'll try to scatter it as we try and listen to it. And so we speak against any destruction, anything in this place that would keep your people from understanding your word. We bind it and we take, captive, we take it captive and we cast it to the place you've prepared for it. And we declare open heavens in this place, Lord, that your people will understand this word and that, Lord, it will bring change into their lives. May it be pleasing unto you, Lord, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, it's at the end of David's life, and he's about to die. He's an old guy. He's in his bed. He's, remi he's remembering what his life was like. And as he's remembering, because that's the context of this passage, he's thinking back to the things his life's amounted to. And one of the key things he reflects on is the group of amazing men who had made him the courageous leader that he was. I mean, the exploits of these men leads like an over-the-top Hollywood action thriller. I mean, you can imagine that the top three guys were like Jack Bauer, Chuck Norris, and Django, all in the same team. I mean, you wonder, how, the, how do you gather guys like this? David had some serious friends. And you know, I always tell you, I mean, each of them, each of them was so amazing. I always tell you, when you read the Bible, use your imagination. Don't read it like a spiritual book because, it's, yes, it is a spiritual book, but it's also a book about life. So here's, uh, can I tell you the story of the three mighty men according to how I see it? Which like, okay, this is how I read it when I read this. Because this is an amazing story by any standards possible. I think the first one, Josheb Bashebeth, the Takimonite, also known as the knife. This guy was a scary one. He's the one, even his name sounds scary, isn't it? <laughs> Josheb Bashebeth, the Takimonite. I was like, whoa, that guy. I mean, everybody was scared of him. He had tattoos on his arms wore an eye patch, liked to play cards, and ate with a knife. No time for a fork. I mean, this guy was a serious, scary guy. You don't mess with a guy like this. He was an expert in every type of warfare known to man. I need to tell you how he, he lost his eye, though, because this is a story that was a story of legends. Uh, one night, he was on a covert mission, and he was ambushed by a unit of Philistines, 800 of them. What happened next is a staff of legends. In the frenzied skirmish that followed on that dark moonlit night, he killed every one of them. Now, nobody knows the details of the story because Josheb did not like to talk about it. And anytime somebody raised a story, he just had a crazed look in his eye that kept them quiet immediately. This was Josheb. The second one was Eliezer, 
son of Dodai. Now, I like to think of Eliezer as the skinny intellectual type who always took life seriously and liked to read philosophy. Uh, this guy uh, never joked around, and when he smiled, the smile never reached his eyes. There was just something interesting about this guy, a little disconcerting. Now, we're told that he was with David when he and David and his men were taunting the Philistines. I suspect on that day what happened, they, were, they, they saw the huge army of Philistines and they realized we can't fight these guys. And so what they decided is, let's taunt them. Let's make fun of them. Let's say all kinds of things about their mothers. And they went there to the hill and they started insulting them and they could tell there was a valley between them. So there was enough time by the time they got to where they were, they'd have bounced. Now the problem is, Eliezer didn't understand jokes. So he didn't realize this was a prank and everybody was supposed to run. So when everybody was running and the Philistines were coming, Eliezer thought, oh, okay, we're supposed to be, and he just jumped in. Now what happened is the guys all ran and they got to a place, they were panting, they were laughing like, oh, did you see them? And then they're looking around and they, where is Eliezer? I thought you were with him. Ah, you burn what? It wasn't, and they were like, okay, now we have to go rescue the guy. Oh my gosh. And so they crawl there and their, their hearts are turned to water because they're thinking the guy is probably dead by now and they go over the hill just in time to see Eliezer strike his sword into the last guy. And Eliezer, I suspect he hadn't even realized guys had run away. He's so serious. He's just thinking, there are so many today. I didn't realize there are so many. I wonder how the rest of the guys are doing. Who? Ha? Who? And, you know, I mean, Eliezer is just killing. He's a killing machine. And at the end of the day, when he, they come, he's, he's frothing at the mouth. He's muttering. He's still striking, even though all the enemies are dead. And it took five guys to restrain him and then pry his hands off the sword because of some rigor mortis that had set in, even though he was still alive. This guy was a scary guy. That's Eliezer. The third one, Shama, was a fun guy. Big guy, full of muscles, famous for his good sense of humor and huge appetite. It was rumored that he had once eaten a full boar all by himself. The story goes that one day he was with a team defending the, the army's food supply. Because the field of, you know, it was Ndengu. You know, <laughs> that's what lentils actually are. You didn't know that, did you? This is actually Ndengu. And this is what the army was going to have for dinner. And then the Philistines came to try and destroy the food supply. I suspect as everybody else was running away, for Shama he was thinking, chapati without ndengu. No! Nobody messes with my food! And Shama grabbed his sword and he jumped into the Philistines and he walked on those guys. And by the time the cooks came back to check what was happening, the ndengu was still there, the Philistines were gone. I mean, these are the kind of guys that surrounded David. They were a serious lot. Everybody respected them. When people talked about them, they talked about them in harsh tones. In fact, they just simply called them the three. Whenever there's a campfire and people would be talking, somebody would say the three. And everybody would fall silent. Because these guys were scary. And by the way, when you read the rest of the story that we didn't even get to read, you find that they were, they were not the only ones. There was another group next to them, behind them, the next lot, the second elite team. They were called the thirty. And the guy we read about last week, his name was Abishai. He was a captain of the 30. He didn't even qualify. Can you imagine? A guy as courageous as Abishai, he didn't even qualify to be one of the three. So anyway, this is just background information for the real story. So it's one afternoon, mighty hot, dry season, harvest season. These guys are now hiding in a cave. This has been their life for the last 10 years. They've been hiding from Saul. Life has been difficult. Not only is Saul still chasing them, but now there's a new problem. The Philistines have invaded the country. Have you ever had those occasions where you thought things could not possibly get worse, and then they did? I mean, this is a situation. It was in the wilderness. Things were bad. We saw that last week. Things got worse. And the Philistines now had taken over. Bethlehem was the town that David had come from. And in his absence, the Philistines had come and overrun it and made it their headquarters. And so now he couldn't even get home. Because the 20 kilometers between him and the cave, the cave where he was hiding, Adullam, and the, he, the place he was from was crawling with enemies. And of course they were in the center of his town. They had taken it over. And David was probably in despair. This was a difficult time in his life. Nothing was working out well. He was probably thinking, now what was I thinking, even agreeing this call? Why did I listen to God when he told me, he promised me I could be king? Surely it's so impossible in this situation. And as he was there thirsty, he began to think about the cool, refreshing water in the well outside his hometown of Bethlehem, bottled at source. 
it went down like nothing else did. And he was there just moaning about it and he just sighed. And everybody looked at him in his sigh. And he said, if I could just have one drop of that water. At that point, words were not useful. I think it was Joshua who looked at the other three, caught their eye, and tilted his head. And without a word, they slipped away like shadows. What the Bible tells us next is almost ridiculous in its lack of drama. It tells us, let me read it for you, because you, I mean, you understand what these guys did was amazing. They went into an enemy camp, beat up the enemy for a glass of water. So here's what happened. It says, they broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well, and carried it back to David. Story over. I mean, really? <laughs> Details, man. I mean, how was this? What did they do? Did they use covert action? Did they send out, did they throw out a decoy and run through? Did they go and fight them? You don't know. All I think is that I can imagine is David is at dinner having uh, his usual meal of dengu stew. Because remember, they had let, that's what they had. Eh? Uh, they probably had had uh, dengu uh, fritters in the morning. And then at lunchtime, they had uh, uh, dengu a la, a, la, a la vegetables. And now they were having dengu stew and casserole. I mean, this is all they ate. It was, it was a bad time for them. And David is there eating his dengu stew and thinking, oh my gosh, life is hard. And in walk the three guys. <laughs> and I kid you not, they put the bottle, bottle that sauce, boom. These guys are dripping with blood. Somebody's ear is hanging loose and they're smiling and they're saying, this is for you, General. Whoa. Somebody make a movie about this stuff. This is great stuff. God's word is so full of rich stories. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think David had good friends? <laughs> Do you think David had loyal friends? Do you think David had friends who had his back? Do you think David had the kind of friends that all of us wish we had? Oh, yes, he did. How did he get these friends? <laughs> you know, let me ask, let me tell you something about these friends. They were so essential. David would never have achieved his God calling if not for them. These are the men who made David king. They're the ones who fought the battle. You know, the interesting thing is the Bible often tells us David took the city. David didn't take the city. It was these men who took the city with him. These are the people who helped him achieve his God-given purpose. He would never have done it without him. Now, we know of David as a courageous warrior, Israel's warrior king. What we often don't understand is that one of the biggest secrets of David's success is he surrounded himself with an army of warriors who are even more courageous than himself. I mean, David never killed 800 people. <laughs> I mean, it's one thing to kill Goliath. It's another thing to kill like Joshua. 800 people. David never fought until his hands froze to the sword. David never fought for the army's food supply and defended it by himself. So even though David was a courageous warrior, the secret of his success is he was surrounded by even more courageous warriors than himself. And the essential lesson that stands out for me in this text, it jumps out when I read it, is that true courage never walks alone. True courage never walks alone. So let me ask you a question. Who are your mighty men and women? Who are the mighty warriors in your life? You know, I suspect this is a hard question for many people in modern days to answer. We live in such a busy world. Work demands, career demands, business demands, family demands. Uh, we have a side hustle that we're trying to do to make a little money on the side. We have night classes that we're trying to attend to improve our academic qualifications. Life is hard! And you'd imagine that technology would come and help us to become a little less busy. What happens with technology? It makes our lives even more frenzied. Somehow now you've got a smartphone you thought it would organize your life. It pushes emails to you as you're going. Those days you have to wait till you get to the office. Now you're, it's coming and your boss expects you to answer then, even if you're driving, isn't it? It's like, I want an answer right away. You've got email and Twitter and Facebook coming at you. You've got YouTube and everybody's forwarding you videos to watch. People have video games. And today, I tell you, nowadays people are losing the ability to even have healthy relationships. I remember watching my, my, uh, my teenage uh, relatives who had a family function recently. And everybody was sitting, they were all sitting around a table, uh, cousins, haven't seen each other for a long time. You know what they were doing? Everybody had a phone and they were tweeting each other. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> and they're poking each other. And then you, you see them all, like, in fact, I realized because I saw them all laughing at the same time and nobody was looking at the other person. I said, oh my goodness, what are we bringing up? What kind of generation is this? They don't even know how to make friends, except virtually. Now, we're not so bad, right? 
<laughs> yeah. But I, I, want, I put it this way. I think for every one of us, we understand that friendships are hard to keep and maintain in today's life. I mean, even for those of us who have good friends, they're always moving because they get a job promotion. Uh, they're moving on up to a, ni- a nicer neighborhood. They're moving to another country to work. People are leaving us all the time. And it's very hard to keep those kinds of consistent, good friendships. Many of us, in fact, we live with that guilt of that person we meet all the time and we say, man, it's been so long, we must have coffee. You ever have that? And like, you know, in your back of your mind, we'll never have coffee. It's just something I'm saying to assage my guilt. I know we'll never have, I don't have time and you don't have time. So let's stop pretending. But you know, we have to pretend because otherwise we would despair. So we say, we must have coffee. And you know, you'll never have coffee. This is a place that many of us live. And as a result, it's easy to wake up one day and to realize you're surrounded by strangers. You're surrounded by professional friends. People who know the the professional or the academic slice of your life and nothing else. People who don't see you as a person, but they see you as a title or as a job description. This is the kind of thing that many of us are finding ourselves in today. People who you can't, nobody that you can be real with. Nobody that you can tell the issues that are going on in your life. People who you have to maintain a certain image with. And unfortunately, for many extroverts, people like myself, we're even worse off than the rest. Because we don't even know it's happening. You know, extroverts, we think that anybody who smiles at us is our best friend. It's like, what? This guy, you haven't even talked to him for six months and you still say he's your best friend. You know, it's like we're surrounded by acquaintances and we think they're friends. And so we don't even realize that life is becoming isolated around us. We're alone in a crowd. We don't realize we're setting ourselves up for failure because true courage never walks alone. Now, none of this is new for many of you. If you've been coming for, <laughs> to Mavuno for any length of time, you probably know where I'm going to with this sermon. You've probably heard it before in some form or the other. You probably know that I'm going to talk about getting into communities and groups of people who work together and who help each other achieve God's purpose. You know the theory. The problem, of course, is theory is not the same as practical, isn't it? Just knowing it doesn't mean it actually works. And some of you have tried only to have your fingers burnt. Some of you have tried to join a life group only to find, which which is what we call our communities here at Mavuno Church, our small groups, our life groups. Some of you have tried to join one only to find that the people were not committed. Uh, People didn't pay as much attention to it as you thought they would. People didn't show up uh, on time. You know, somehow people got busy and you found that you were the only one showing up at the meeting on only three of you and it got so discouraging. There's some of you who've actually had those experiences where you came into a group and you found you had nothing in common with the people. Everybody was much younger than you. You didn't think they had any value to add to you and you wondered, why me? Why am I stuck with such people who have no value to add to my life? Anybody found themselves, okay, don't put up your hand because those people might be around you. But many of us have struggled and found ourselves wanting to connect and yet unable to connect. So what's the secret? How do we find those mighty warriors those courageous people who will help us to be courageous when our own challenges come up? Is it finding people who are like us? People who are the same age? People who are the same social demographic? People who are moving mobilely upward like us? How do we find people who we can walk with and achieve our vision? I want us to look at David because I think there's some great answers that he gives us uh, as we begin to address a question like this. First Samuel, chapter 22, verse 1 to 2, is actually going back, back even more farther in time. And this is how David found his mighty warriors. So if we can, find, if we can learn from how he discovered his mighty warriors, maybe we, it can help us discover our own mighty warriors. First Samuel chapter 22, verse 1 to 2. And this is what it says. David left Gath and escaped to the soul of Adullam. Now, we, re- we remember last week we say David actually was running away from Saul. He went into the Philistine country. He took refuge in a, a country, a place called Gath, a town called Gath. And now he was running away from there uh, and going to, still hiding from Saul, going back home. And he's hiding there uh, to the cave of Adullam. This is the first time we hear about the cave of Adullam, uh, which was David's safe house. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. And all those who were in distress or in debt, or discontented, gathered around him, and he became their commander. Around 400 men were with him. Now, you need to remember where David had just come from. David had a great job. He was working in the palace. He was connected with all the who's who. He was uh, the son-in-law to the king. He was best friends with the crown prince. All the 
physically intellectual, the, the stimulate, the, the intellectually stimulating people, all the wealthy people, all the moving on up type of people in the country, were his friends. They were on his speed dial. He was connected. He was rolling with the rollers, balling with the ballers. This is who David was. And then something happened. He fell out with his boss. And at that point, he had to run away. And, you know, before this, I suspect if you had asked David to constitute a group of mighty men around him, he would have been able to pick out all the top guys in the kingdom and call them into a Bible study, and they would have grown, people like himself. But at this point, he didn't have a choice. And look who comes to him. Very interesting people, not that impressive. The Bible tells us they were either in distress, which means they were in trouble with the law, in debt, which means they were unable to pay their bills, or discontented, which means they were dissatisfied with life. How's that for a group of people around you? I mean, imagine if all your friends were running away from the law, were in debt, or were just unhappy. Anybody have friends? Okay, some of you are saying, oh, my friends sound like that a lot. Uh, no, 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 no. I mean, you, you need to understand, David had some... <laughs> the only thing these guys had in common, some of them came from his hometown, others came from all over the country. The only thing they had in common is that there were people with issues. They had mega issues surrounding their lives. They were not socially acceptable or respectable people. And nobody believed that these people would ever amount to much. Not legally anyway. But fast forward. And a few years later, a huge difference has happened. They've been through tough times together. Such difficult times that almost broke them. On one occasion, the Bible tells us, I don't know if you know this, his men, David's men actually wanted to kill him. Do you, have you ever read that story? First Samuel chapter 30, around verse 6, uh, David took them into a mission. It backfired badly. All their families uh, were attacked, and, and they came and they found no wives, no children. Everything had been destroyed, and there was nothing. And the Bible says the men were so angry at David, they wanted to stone him. Uh, this is the kind of stuff these guys had gone through. They had been through every kind of problem you can possibly imagine. But you know what it had done? This time in the wilderness had actually drawn them closer. They had become a united group. They had found a common mission. And that mission was to make David the king of Israel according to God's purpose and promise. And as each one of them continued with this journey, they were forged into a band of mighty warriors, united around this mission. Every one of them did valiant acts. And when one of them succeeded, the whole group succeeded. Everybody did well because each of them was doing well. And now they had moved from being a band of very discontented, unhappy, needy people. And now they were contributing changing the world, impacting their nation, bringing the, 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 the fight to the enemy. They were an army and a force to contend with, adding value to one another. This is the way it was always meant to be. That's why I'm saying that true courage never walks alone. Now, I need to say this, that when we started Mavuno Church, we were very convinced, we were very convicted that we needed to start a church for people who did not like church. We needed to start a church for people who didn't quite fit in regular church. They didn't understand God. They thought that God was just this abstract concept. They were suspicious of the church because the church never spoke their language. And I was so convicted, and the people around me were convicted, that this must be who we, started, who we start the church for. It was very hilarious sometimes in the early days, because you know people who don't know what church is, they don't know how to dress in church. They don't know how to act in church. They don't know how to look in church. I mean, we had, I, I remember how many guys have told me the first time they came to Mavuno, they slept in their car because they were so hungover. They reached the, the dry, the, there's one guy, I remember, in Mavuno, Kampala, sharing that story. First time he came to this church, uh, he came from, I think it was Carnival, and on his way, he, somebody had told him at 3 o'clock at night that there's a church called Mavuno for people like him uh, with his issues. So he drove to the parking lot, and he posed there, and as he was coming out, he decided to take a nap, and he slept through the whole service. Uh, I mean, what, this is the kind of people we're supposed to reach. Uh, it was people who didn't know how to dress in church. I mean, somebody once told me, why don't you be like the other churches? Uh, there's a church in town that had put a sign, uh, no miniskirts, uh, no tank tops. No, I mean, you know, they didn't even write the words. They just put a miniskirt, X, a tank top, X. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. This is who we are supposed to be reaching. We can't put a sign like that. These people need a church for them. Uh, I remember that one person actually came up to me one day and said, there's a higher per capita of dreadlocks in Mavuno Church uh, than there is in the whole of Nairobi. Uh, did you ever notice that, Pastor? I said, I didn't even know that, but I thank God that those people are finding a church that they can come in and be accepted in, and they don't feel ostracized. I said, this is who we are called to reach. This is who we are called to reach. And you know, I always tell my, in fact, I told my, my, my staff team this last week, I said, look, guys, May we never forget who we are supposed to reach. 
may we never forget who we exist for. Because you know what happens is with time, you can end up becoming, facing the pressure to become a respectable church. You know, we've sort of been successful now, and we've become a big church, and the pressure now is that you want to behave like, you know, it's like you want to tell the guys with the dreadlocks, uh, please move on the side. Eh? Uh, just allow the, you know, because politicians might come in and uh, big, big bishops in the city might want to come. And so you guys sit on the side and let, me, let, let's, let the Maury say, yeah, you guys look a little respectable, the ones around here. Uh, you guys be the ones who sit in the front. It's very tempting to want to do that. And I say to our staff team, may we never forget that we were called to reach people with issues and to bring them into the kingdom. This is who we're meant to be. And I, and I said, one of the reasons I believe God has blessed this church, it's not because of the gifting of the senior pastor or the team around him. It's not because of these pastors you see here. The reason is because God dearly loves those people who don't like church. He does. He's their God too. He has a plan for their lives. He wants them reached. And I believe that as soon as we began to, we began to align to what God wanted, God released his blessings on this church. May we never forget that. You know, the interesting thing that has happened to us, though, is over the years, we've, we've, our demographic has sort of changed. Uh, those early days, we were people, just a young bunch of people, many in their first jobs. Over the eight years, what's happened now is we have many more respectable people. Some of them were those people who walked in at that time, but today they're more respectable. Uh, they sort of learned how to act in church. They sort of carry a big Bible like a real Christian. You know what I'm saying? Uh, they, they know the language. They know how to pray in public. They know those things. They sort of clean their act up. It's very easy for us. I mean, it's, 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 th we've changed. And, as I, and as, I, I, as I look at the demographic, I realize we're not just young people anymore. There are older people in this church, and many of them who come here. There are families that are coming. There are grandparents who are here as well. Uh, we are becoming a, a family church in that sense, and that's a great thing. I believe that even though we are so diverse now, no longer the homogenous group of young people, I believe there's still something that ties our hearts together. I believe that the people who come to this church are people who are discontented with the status quo. They're tired of reality as it is. They're not just looking for a nice, respectable church to be part of. They're looking for something that will help them achieve their God purpose and impact society. That's who comes. By the way, I believe anybody who comes to this church and isn't that, they usually get tired and move very quickly. And the people I see here are people who are, re are ready for something different. This is what ties us together. We may not be what we'd like to be, but we're sure not what we used to be. And God is changing us every day more and more into Jesus-like, and we are achieving the purpose, learning to achieve the purpose that he designed us for. This is who we are, Mavuno. This is who God has called us to be. Now, the reality, though, is that along this journey of purpose, there are challenges. I need to be always telling you the fine print. There are challenges. You know, when people do, I, I find people who come into church, do Mizizi, and they're so excited about their faith. Wow, I love this church. I love the reality. I love what I'm finding. And then challenges come and they give up. Because nobody ever told them the, the fine print. I need to say it today. Being a Christian is hard. It's not easy. You're going against the... the, 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 the you're, you're swimming against the current. Often you're doing what other people in the culture would think foolish or would never do. It's not an easy thing to be a fearless influencer. It sounds nice, <laughs> but there's a cost to being that. And many people, when the challenge comes, they find themselves overwhelmed. You're going to find yourself facing such difficult times. If you really are determined to be a fearless influencer, if you're really determined to find your God purpose, you'll find yourself in many times facing such a position that you'll want to give up, you'll be angry, you'll be disappointed, you'll be disillusioned, and you might actually walk away. And at this point, the one thing that will dramatically increase your chances of succeeding and achieving your God-given purpose is that you're surrounded with a group of courageous warriors who are determined that you would finish well alongside them. This is what we learn from this book that we are reading, from this man called David. Because true courage never walks alone. Now, perhaps you've been waiting to find a book group of people who are like you. You know, you know you're, you're, a, you're a good person, isn't it? And you're moving up. Your career is uh, thing looking up. You're moving on up. You're looking for people who are intellectually stimulating, uh, people who are going places like you. Uh, maybe you're looking for people who uh, sort of are, are farther along the road that can motivate you, inspire you. Now, I want to say this, that there's a problem with that approach. There's a problem for, with looking for people who are just like you or even better to help you uh, move in this way. 
The, re the problem is this, and actually I'll even say there's a couple of problems. The first problem is that it can lead to very shallow relationships. If you form a group of friends who are there because they all fit the criteria, they all look nice. You know what I'm talking about? Not people with issues, not people who are younger than you and have no money and they can't add value to the group. Uh, not pe when you start a chama, they can't even contribute like the rest of you. I mean, you know what I'm saying? You're looking for people who are like you. Here's a problem. Life happens. And if life ever happens to one of the people and they can no longer qualify to be the nice person they were brought into the group to be, guess what happens at that point? They can't be real. Because they know if they confess the issues they're going through, they will be shut out from the group. The group has no bandwidth to manage messy people. So you know what happens if you have a group, nice, cute, homogenous group like that? You have shallow relationships. If somebody says, how's your week? And you know your wife's about to leave you or your business about to collapse, you say, praise God, it's going well. My goodness, church can be a, f a place full of shallow people. Shallow people who never deal with issues. This is danger number one. Danger number two is that it can lead to complacency. If you're f looking for a group like this, it can lead to complacency. Because it can become very focused around meeting my needs. People who can help me meet my needs. And it stops being about a group that is there to meet other needs. A bigger mission that keeps a group going. Because every group of mighty warriors needs a mission bigger than themselves. This is what it means when true courage never walks alone. You must have other people who are centered around something that is just bigger than meeting our needs. And so let me encourage you to stop seeing people as they are and begin to see them as God sees them. As people of huge potential. Mighty warriors in the making. Tell your neighbor, I may not look like much, but I'm a mighty warrior. There's a mighty warrior inside. This is who we are. It doesn't matter how they look. There's something inside them that when God reveals it, oh my goodness, there's a Joshua waiting to be found, to be discovered in that person next to you. The thing I've come to realize is there's no perfect life group. My own life group, I mean, we almost broke up at the beginning of this year. We had a, a, a CUS make party. You know what a CUS make party is? Uh, CUS make party, uh, many of you have been coming to Mavuno, you know what that is. Uh, that's a party when you come together as a life group to say, it's not working, let's just quit. And, uh, we, my and this is past time telling you this, huh? so I, we, I, it's, it's serious issues, man. We sat there, I mean, the group had gotten to a place where guys were coming late for meetings, uh, half the group would come one week, the next week another half would come, they wouldn't remember what guys talked about. It was just, there was no commitment, uh, people were feeling they're too busy to make the commitment to the group. And so, I mean, it was just like a complete... Just disillusionment. And so we called the CUS Make Party, and it was like, this is our last time. Uh, let's have some nice food, uh, celebrate how much we tried, and just say to each other, it's been real. You know, I mean, this, is, this was the plan. Uh, and so we came together, and we had the CUS Make Party. And in the middle of it, as we were just saying our last words, one person shared. One person said, listen, I am so disappointed because I need people in my life to help me succeed. I need people to help me succeed in my life and in my ministry. And I want people to help me walk the long haul of life. And I thought this group was it. I really had prayed this group was it. And right now, as this group dissolves, I have no one that can walk this journey with me. And I remember that at that point, the conversation changed. And different ones began to say, I have no one as well. I would like that as well. And at that point, we made a decision. We said, why don't we try this again? But we made a change. Before that, we had been a very, I'd say, almost internal, uh, internally focused group. We'd meet every week, and we would sort of talk about what we were going through. Or we'd come up with a, somebody would say, I want us to discuss this issue. And we'd discuss it. It was more driven by us. We, <laughs> this is a big confession, by the way, I'm making as a pastor of Mavuno Church. My own life group was not operating like a Mavuno life group. It was about us. And at that point, what we decided is we said, look, we're going to become a Mavuno life group. We're actually going to be taking the sermon from church and using that to motivate us, to apply that, and become the people God is calling us to be. And we began that. I want to tell you this, that my life group, this is the beginning of the year, my life group has become a centerpiece of my life. I love that group. I have actually changed my travel schedule to make sure I land on Thursday so I can be there in time for life group. Even when I'm traveling in different, different uh, distant places. I've changed my hotel reservations to make sure I'm home in time for life group. It's such a highlight of my week. And we've learned to be vulnerable as we discuss the things that we learn in God's word. It's such a joy for me to have friends. I now know I have mighty warriors. People around me who I am determined that they will succeed. But they are determined that I too will succeed.
Because I'm convinced, guys. I, I'm, I don't just teach this. I'm convinced that true courage. Somebody say it with me. True courage never walks alone. True courage never walks alone. I want to conclude this message in prayer. And as I do so, I want to make a confession. I confess that we at Mavuno have not always been good at this life group thing. Many times, I've, I've even met people who've told me, Pastor M, I signed up for a life group. I really tried, but you guys didn't call me back on time. People took months to call me. Uh, people forgot that I even applied. Some people have said, Pastor M, you know, you, you told us to apply for this thing, and I applied, and the person I spoke to just didn't even seem to know what they were doing. I want to say I'm sorry. I confess. We, we, we're, we're learning this thing. We haven't been good. We, we, you know, the interesting thing about us as Mavuno, sometimes we look like we have our act together. We've got issues as well. Uh, and I'm talking about your pastors now. And we're learning. We're also learning to be good leaders as God helps us. So forgive us for that. If we've hurt you in any way, forgive us for that. But what we want to do is we want to give everybody here a chance to be in a group of mighty warriors, men and women who will help you walk towards your destiny. So don't give up on us because we won't give up on you either. And here's what I want to do. I want to give you a phone number. Please note this number. If you're not in a life group, you want to note this number. Or if your life group hasn't been working, 0700-322-680. or oh, 322, sorry, 680. I think it's on the board. 322-680. And today after service, I mean, what I'm going to ask you to do, actually even right now, is send a text to that number and just put your name on it. And what we'll do is in the next two days, one of our pastors will call you and just connect with you and see how we can place you in a group that connects you with mighty warriors who are going in the same direction. Some of you have tried to be in a group before your group broke up. This is a chance for you to connect with a new group and walk in that direction. Listen, guys, we're saying this journey is hard. Courage is not something that we can just summon up by ourselves. We need people who will be courageous alongside us to help us achieve that mission. And it's my desire that every single one of us will finish that journey well. So please sign up if you haven't. I want to speak to the people who are, who are in life groups. Let me just, show of hands, how many of you are in a group that's working, you enjoy your group? Come on, just raise your hand right now. To God be the glory. Wow, there's so many of us in this place. I thank God for you. I praise God for what you're in. I hope that God is opening your eyes through this message today. The kind of potential you have in your group. It's easy to take it for granted. These are people who will help you to finish well. I want to challenge you to do two things. Number one, take the level of realness to the next level. Move it from shallow. If your group has just been doing their own thing, insist that we start doing someone's now and actually applying God's word. I want to tell you this. People have a temptation to study other things. Many times it's like, let's bring a new deeper study. But people who say that, what they want to do is run away from applying God's word and enter into a place of knowledge which has no threat to their lives. Do you understand that? Many deep Christians, they know so much, but they never practice. And what we challenge our groups to say is to say, look, take the word that is preached on Sunday. Practice it. Because God is more interested in doers than in hearers. And so challenge your group to go deep. And it must start with you. You share your brokenness. You challenge them about that and ask them to care for you. And hopefully other people will be compelled as well to do that. Number two, I want to challenge you number two, is what if you could challenge your group to enter a place where they're no longer living for themselves, but beginning to be of value to the rest of the church. You know, David's people came because they had issues. They needed care. But a certain point changed when they became mature and they became mighty warriors fighting for the rest of the nation. What if your group could challenge every single member to be signed up in a ministry at Mavuno and contributing? So when you come together every week, you're talking about the things you did and the challenges you faced and you're praying about that for one another. What if, and I've had groups that are doing this, what if you could challenge your group members to adopt two or three new life groups or Mizizi groups? And you could actually be the ones who help start other people along the same journey of purpose that your group has been put on. So I want to challenge you this week. Have this conversation in your life groups and trust God to lead you in the direction that you should be going to. Because true courage, or oh, come on, tell it to your neighbor, true courage never walks alone. I want to pray for us as we conclude. And I want to pray for every single one of us who is here, who recognizes, my goodness, I'm in that place where I am in a crowd, but I'm alone. I have friends, but they're professional friends or they're friends of, we, do, we raise money together, but I actually don't have anybody who's determined to help me achieve my purpose, my God-given purpose in Christ Jesus. Maybe you've even been in a life group that has not been operating that way. 
But today as God has spoken to you, you're saying, you know, Pastor M, I am going to, by God's help, commit to make my group that way. Or somebody else who's saying, I'm not in a group, but you pray for me, Pastor M, because I want to take that step. Join a group that will actually achieve this. Some of you are visiting from other churches. You're not going to be here next Sunday, but I want to pray for you as well. If you're in that place and you're saying, I want to go back to my home church and join a group of people who will help me to finish my journey well. If you're here, stand up to your feet. I want to pray for you and bless you even as we conclude our service. Come on, stand to your feet. Don't worry about your neighbor. This is about courage. Being courageous enough to understand your place of need and to stand up and own up to it and to say, I need people in my life. Come on, let's appreciate them as they stand up across the building. So many different people standing up in different places. Some of them from Avuno, others from other places. But to God be the glory for every single one of them. Come on, just lift up your hands before yourself like this right now as I bless you. Father, I thank you for everyone standing up right now saying, Lord, I need your help. I've been convicted by this message. I want to finish well. I want to be a mighty warrior. But I don't have those mighty warriors in my life. And Lord, today as I hear this message, with your help, I want to commit myself that I will join this journey of purpose. That I will look, to, if I'm in a group already, I'm going to connect those people back and say we must finish well. Lord, if I need to be in a new group, that Lord, I would take the steps that will help me to achieve this God-given purpose. But Lord, I pray for every single one of these who are standing, that Lord, they will finish well. It's your desire that none of them will fall by the wayside. None of them will be defeated by the challenges ahead of them. But Lord, they would triumph over them with courage, unafraid. And so I speak your blessing over them, Lord. May none of them fall away, but every one of them achieve that friendship, those friends who will sacrifice everything for them to be the people that you're calling them to be. I bless them now. And I thank you. Come on, let's all stand to our feet and join those who are standing. Is God a good God? Oh, yes, He is. And He's determined that we all are courageous. Come on, lift your hands now before the Lord. I want to bless you as you go into the week. Remember this week, there's, um, there's a father and son's picnic on, uh, uh, out, 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 a thing on uh, Saturday. Please come if you're a father. Remember to sign up for Fearless Outside if you are interested in coming for that uh, leadership summit from Avuno Church. And then lastly, if you're not in a group or you'd like to be in a group, please make sure that you sign up after this. I want to bless you now. Father, I thank you for every person who calls this church their home. And even for those you've brought to, to visit with us today from different places. I thank you that it's not a coincidence that, Lord, we heard your words today. This word that brings transformation. I want to thank you that, Lord, you have a plan and a purpose for every single one of us. And it is not a mediocre plan. It is a great plan, a, a, a world-changing plan. And, Lord, we are all on that journey to discover your purpose and to activate it. And, Lord, I pray that now you would surround us with mighty men and women. I pray that, Lord, you would build a courage in us, a quality difference within us, that people in our workplaces will look at us and be astounded and say there's something different about you. You're not determined by circumstances. You're not afraid of people. But you do what your convictions tell you. That Lord, there'll be Daniels in this place. And Esther's in this place. And David's in this place. Men and women of courage. And so I speak a blessing over you. May your children be blessed because of your courage. May those people around you be blessed because of your courage. I bless you in the name of the Father. And of the Son. And of the Holy Spirit. And God's people say it with a shout. God bless you. Have a wonderful, courageous week. See you next week.